everyone. Welcome to Former People's second podcast, or vidcast, I should say, on our third issue, Weird as the New Modern. I am the co-editor of Former People, Stephen Mihalkov. I'm joined today with my co-editor, uh, C. Derek Varn. And today we're going to discuss a variety of topics regarding the whole question of weird, its relationship to modernism, some views on contemporary weird fiction, and then some thoughts on some of the other pieces we have in our magazine. So I think what maybe the first question that I think we should probably discuss, even though it may come across as the most banal, is how are we actually defining weird fiction? So, you know, why, what makes a story weird, let us say? Uh, Derek, do you want to maybe walk us through that? Uh, weird fiction is an interesting thing. We, um, I read an anthology by Jeff Vandermeer, uh, by Jeff and Ann Vandermeer, I believe. It was called The Weird. And they date weird fiction beginning with the fin de siècle uh, movement in the UK and in the UK and France, um, and which is a lot of proto surrealist stuff and a lot of like late Gothic material. Uh, but the thing is, the weird uh, as a comprehension definition doesn't really uh, hold. If you try to come up with something, you're like, oh, but is not just a horror story, or oh, is that not just gothic fiction, or, you know, oh, is that not just really dark magical realism, or whatever. I tend to find the weird as a sensation uh, that's related to terror and wonder at the natural universe, or like, or a sensation dealing with the horrors of the natural universe, um, or the weirdness of everyday life, you know. Um, and that's a broad definition, and with that definition, you can put a lot of different authors from Lord Donsani to Ranazuke Akutagawa, you know, into the, into the, the mix. Um, the, the weird sort of gets clarified in the United States by a mixture of a pulp magazine that comes out of the turn of the century. Um, and the, the sort of development around H.P. Lovecraft. Um, and so the weird then takes on a definite tone that it kind of just vaguely had. Because before then, anything that you want to call weird, weird fiction also belonged to another genre. Or it was just considered literary fiction. Um, so like Poe has elements of weird fiction, but his stuff uh, can be generally categorized as either gothic or detective stories. Um, Algernon Blackwood... Uh, late romantic stuff. Uh, Lord Dornisani also could be considered late romantic. It's not until really the writers that emerge out of Weird Magazine that you get the the genre sort of more defined. Yeah, it's interesting um, how weird fiction sort of, in a way, is a manifestation of a certain moment in literary time. Now, admittedly, you know, it's not perfectly the case since, you know, we have contemporary weird authors, which I don't think anybody would have anxiety calling weird. But there is something to be said about the particular moment in time in which it comes. So it it could be as banal as just weird magazine uh, coming to fruition in, you know, the turn of the century through the yeah, I, I forget. I know it folded at one point, then came back. But let's say the first twenty to thirty years of the century. Um, uh, it's interesting that because it comes back like in the seventies and eighties, and then really kind of come back again in the last ten years. Um, what's interesting to me, for example, is the relationship between weird fiction and gothic fiction, because you can see both. You know. We use neo in a lot of things here, and I'm sorry for the neologism. But, like, neo-gothic fiction, which was really big in the late 80s, early 90s, mid-90s, was a really big part of pop culture. And it's it's easier to see what how that was related to standard gothic fiction. If you look at, like, Anne Rice and you look at, you know, the monk from, you know, 17th, 18th century British literature... You can see direct parallels, an obsession with sexuality, an obsession with the antiquarian, and the supernatural. Weird fiction is a little different because it, it's not as easily categor- categorized in the same way as according to the supernatural. Its mood is much more cosmic, and a lot of things you encounter in it are utterly alien. 
But it's interesting to think about how the, the, those two genres, like in contemporary culture, sort of cycle back in genre literature, whether or not it's the weird being predominant or the gothic being predominant. I don't really have a theory as to why they cycle. I mean, you know, it's like the theory between why do vampire and zombie pop culture ephemera cycle through. But it definitely cycles through. Um, and some authors that are sort of the borderline between that, like, say, Caitlin Kiernan, will be, like, labeled one one decade and the other another decade. Um, so, you know, take that as you will. That's something to consider. And I think it has an interesting relationship to modernism because the, the relationship of, like, dark romanticism, gothic stuff to modernism is very well explored. You know, a lot of you, like, your first modernist poets are really moved by Browning, you know, Robert Browning. That's almost like, you know, fin de siècle, uh, like, late Gothic literature. Um, there's there's all the obsessions with um, Gothic romances and stuff that come out. And you see a lot in some of the early modernist work. And you, you also see it in, like, you know, the way that Baudelaire likes a lot of early Gothic fiction and Rimbaud and a lot of the French fin de siècle writers who are also early modernist have a relationship to it. Uh, the, the relationship of weird fiction to early modernism really only seems to be explored, like, recently. But for one thing is even though a lot of literary writers can be seen as writing weird fiction, things that are clearly weird fiction... Um, were generally considered so pulpy as to not get serious literary merit until probably about 10 years ago. Well, it's, it's interesting, uh, though, that uh, we had in our issue a discussion uh, on a lot of these topics with S.T. Joshi, and he, he brings up the idea that somehow that's a little bit different uh, depending on what context you're in. He seems to think that um, in you know the sort of like pulp versus... Uh, "Quote unquote high literature divide is something you more often see in the United States vis-a-vis weird literature. That weird got relegated to the pulp, whereas somehow in Britain, you know, it just was more or less more, uh, accepted into the mainstream. And so maybe you know maybe that's something we should consider. Is are we perhaps excluding ourselves to a U.S. phenomenon? I don't know about that. I mean, like I don't think I don't think a lot of the the weird fiction writers who even came out of Britain were have survived British literary taste. But they may have been contemporaneously considered literary. You can think of like um Lord Dunsany or uh Astronaut Blackwood or Robert W. Chambers, you know, Robert W. Chambers the Yellow Sign, for example, starts off basically in the realm of oh yeah, but he's he's an American, excuse me. But he writes in faux Victoriana, so it's so I easily get it confused. And this is also a problem because a lot of the pulp writers in the states and a lot of the weird fiction writers in the U.S. are so derivative of late Victorian writing styles, and probably because of the influence of Blackwood and Dunsany. But it's harder to you know, to, to, to really make a clear case. And uh, I'll put another character out on the, the wall that will complicate that thesis. Um, Ambrose Bierce was sort of always considered a literary writer. And he's American, he's about as American you can, you can get, but he's definitely highly influential in weird fiction. Some of his stuff is straight realism. Some of his stuff is psychological realism. Some of his stuff is gothic fiction. And some of his stuff is actually definitely in the realm of of, of of weird fiction, and uh, he was pretty much, you know, a, a major contemporary literary figure. It's interesting that you you would bring up Bierce and and by virtue of Bierce realism, because I think that is some of the um, or one of the core details in weird that I think is rightly needs to be explored is especially when you think of weird's relationship with the previous romantic and gothic. Which I think to everybody who reads, particularly the canonical weird fiction, it's clearly obviously the case. It's there. Um, love, I mean, just keeping it really simple, Lovecraft, you know, unquestionably admitted and practiced his, uh, f- you know, a certain fidelity to Poe for a long time. But what was an interesting sort of wrinkle to this whole kernel is this whole idea of realism. Now, there's a certain element where realism was somewhat becoming or had been the dominant tone. 
of writing sort of in the contemporaneous time to weird. I would complicate that by saying that Poe is a pretty realistic writer. I mean, the only, the only elements of the supernatural that you find in him are not unquestionable. So for example, you know, the possible presence of a vampire in the fall of the Hassel Usher is not, un, it's not an unquestionable instance of, uh, of the supernatural being there. Um, and the only things where the supernatural for sure shows up are in allegorical works. So you usually like say, uh, um, the mask of the red death. So like even Bierce there, he's not that far out of the tradition. I think our de- want to make demarcations there cleaner is complicated by the fact that American Gothic literature was never as divorced from realism as its European counterpart. And so the transition to weird fiction wasn't hard. Um, I, another example of that would be the anti-transcendentalist writers. So Melville and Hawthorne, you know, are the, also sometimes called the dark romantics. And yeah, there's supernatural in there, but it's very much rooted in the culturally real. So like the minister's black veil, the ominous presence in that is the veil. Well, I guess one of the reasons why I bring up uh, realism was not to necessarily find strong demarcations, but it's more or less a signaling of s- some of the differentiation you are arguably going to see, which is, shall we call it like, not necessarily anti-religious, but sort of like a new uh, religion sort of get bur- you know, midwifed by certain advan- uh, you know, you want to call them advances if you will, but certain developments in science and the culture, which sort of tr- uh, goes along the way of moving us a little bit away from the notions of, you know, say transcendentalism or perhaps certain notions of Christian morality, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, like the idea of like a ghost story, you know, it's like, well, you know, I'm a, you know, sort of echo, you know, sort of like Stanley Kubrick's attitude, which is like, in a way, ghost stories are optimistic because it posits life after death. It posits some sort of ordering principle that's somewhat positive uh, or ar- ar- arguably positive in the world, whereas particularly a lot of weird fiction, you know, in Lovecraft, but in others sort of doesn't even grant itself that sort of ordering principle anymore. It, do- right, it doesn't so, say it doesn't have an ordering principle. It's just no, not necessarily a positive ordering principle. You know, so to push back against you a little bit there, um, kind of is, is to say that what would be the big difference between say Ambrose Bierce um, and Poe, if you want a real demarcation between sort of American late Gothic literature and uh, weird fiction would be that Poe has got a pretty unsupernatural worldview. His relationship to religion is ambivalent, just like the relationship to religion that you see in Hawthorne and uh, Melville. Those are also ambivalent. It's not clear. If you're away from it, and the way the transcendentalists don't, even if they are religious, they have a darker view of it. So again, that, that strong demarcation isn't there. But what what is there, I think that maybe you can really pull out, if you're going to use Poe and Beers as your primary example cases, Poe has an aestheticized universe. Beers doesn't. You know, it, it's darkly aestheticized, but there's an aesthetic principle. You know, there's the beautiful woman who dies young and all that. Beers doesn't have any of that. I mean... You know, we call it the experience of the Civil War, but that's just lacking in his literature. And, you know, his war literature is brutal, absolutely brutal. It's not aestheticized at all. You know, it's like the difference between a Quentin Tarantino film and Sam Peckinpah, where the brutality in Quentin Tarantino was obviously just made pretty. And in Sam Peckinpah, it's not that pretty at all. Well, in, in a way, we can think of that. Um, well, there's a couple ways to unpack that. You know, one way of thinking of that is like, well, in the case of Poe or Tarantino or some of the other more gothic romantic types, you know, that aestheticized universe is in some ways an ordering principle. You know, and, you know, it, it, you know, the idea of you know, sort of tropes and you know, sort of almost musically, you know, ideas of um, light motifs, repetitions, what have you. That's a sort of structured organizational type. Whereas it seems like Beers, as you pointed out, either through the war fiction, but or even 
some of the other later weird writers in the aftermath, you know, this will be more the later ones after World War One, World War Two. But even just with the sort of advancement of, shall we just say, like the development of the new or things that a lot of modernists would have responded to, the old ideas of ordering principles are slowly being questioned or maybe not even slowly being questioned. They are being questioned. And I think sort of this is why I think we, you know, maybe coming at it from different angles, but I think ultimately coming at it, are looking at weird and modernism as somehow dancing around each other. And I think a lot of it may have to do with things you're sort of alluding to in the sort of demarcation between Poe and Beers, at least as a sort of talking point, which is that idea of, you know, what in the world was happening to really question some of these ordering principles. Right. I mean, you have... You have the progressive, like, distrust in language that you see in the modernist writers. Um, you know, even though they're some of the most beautiful writers, you have a progressive distrust in the, the logic of language. So you, you know, you can take an example from Irish literature. You look at Joyce, who's like the writer of language. He, like, you know, Finnegan's Wake is basically a 600 page prose poem. And then you look at his prime protege, Samuel Beckett. And all that's stripped out and distrusted, and the language itself is distrusted, and you can feel it. Um, you can also see that in Hemingway. You know, the, the language is stripped down and distrusted. And, and it's interesting because that was really avant-garde at the time it was written. It's totally accepted as, like, standard style now. But, and so we can't feel it as anything really revelatory. Conversely, um, you know, like like the weird... Fiction writers don't have that distrust of language, but they do have, like, distrust of aesthetic principle. Um, you know, the one thing you can say about most of the weird fiction writers is they love their language as Baroque as it can get sometimes. You know, like, if you try to come away with any, any ordering principle of the cosmos from Lovecraft, you're not going to get one. Even the Cthulhu mythos is not actually a mythos. Like, that development happens later by other writers who systematize what he did, where he's not systematizing it. He's pl- putting in little jokes and references and puns, you know, that feed back into real things, feed back into fake things. But there's no real system there. It's create the feeling of a very big universe that makes no sense. Right. I would even go so far as to say the weird above and beyond the weird fiction writers being anxious about aesthetics as such, I would say they are anxious about the universe, period. And I think it is that grand. If there is sort of like cosmology at play, I think that sort of anxiety is being manifested. And I think you can definitely make that case with Lovecraft, particularly as Lovecraft over his life definitely expressed interest in astronomy and in the various sciences of the time, it's and it's in a weird way a reflection also of the past to the degree which he thought of himself as an 18th century figure. Uh, there's a couple ways of reading that. Arguably, there's a way of saying he's an he may have been an arch enlightenment type, even though arguably he has manifestations which are hard, very hardly uh, anything we might call enlightened. Uh, you know, uh, disbelief in human reason is generally not something you would consider part of the enlightenment project. Absolutely. But, um, but yes, I mean, you know, Lovecraft goes from like a, if you, I have the d- distinction of having read and or listened to every single thing he's ever written. And he does go from like a basic romantic. If you read his early portrait, some of which he wrote when he was like 12, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's basically romantic pastiche and that glows away over time. Um, and, you know, his interest in science and stuff increases over time. But let's be fair. Uh, we're, again, we're, we're, we seem to be arguing that weird fiction is, you know, dealing with cosmic dread, and it is. But you know, from a particularly materialist modernist worldview. But a lot of the early weird fiction writers in England were Catholic, right? So, like, it's not that I, I tend to think that's skipped over. Um, when people make generalizations about weird fiction, I mean, it's interesting that they were Catholic writers in English so that they were sort of out of their their natural habitat, so to speak. And Protestant, you know, Catholics are really tolerated for most of its most of its Protestant history in England. But it's still you're still dealing with religious writers. And after Lovecraft, that changes significantly. Um, although, like, August or left, I do believe was religious. 
Well, let's definitely uh, press on this issue a little more. Uh, and it's, I guess it's the whole question of can, you know, what are we to make of either the religion of these writers or the lack thereof? So certainly, I, yeah, and I definitely am on the same page with you, particularly in the British context. So not only just the English writers, but also the Irish writers who are writing in English. Um, you, know, the, you know, that the religiosity is, I think, a little bit clearer in them. Uh, Lovecraft, in a weird way, sort of in his in his non-literary writing expresses anxiety at the very least over Christianity. But it, it also but, but it's it's a point of contestation. What sort of even if it's not sort of organized Christian writing, what is the you know, is there some sort of cosmological element to his writing or at least is it touching upon these issues? Well, I mean, in so much that he has a cosmology, it's a naturalized cosmology because every, you know, elder god or whatever is actually pretty much an alien. And in so much, you know, and it's hostile. Uh, humans are not, like, the things in, in Lovecraft, by and large, aren't even after human beings. Human beings are just completely incidental. Um, in his early stories, they're kind of after human beings, but in his later ones, it, it just seems like you just happen to to be interested in the wrong thing. Yeah, wrong place at the wrong time kind of affair, or right. or you you just are unfortunately in the way of something so grand it really isn't even considering you. Right. I mean, you know, you run into the Great Isle of Dreaming Cthulhu, and it doesn't have a personal problem with you, <laughs> like. But, but what's, it's interesting that we bring that up because that is where I would agree that it's in that conception of the universe where Lovecraft was definitely not a Christian. If he were a Christian, the primacy of humanity, even if you know humanity is insignificant compared to the deity, humanity would still be you know the core element. It, it would be the the locus of the drama, as it were. But it's not in in Lovecraft. Is you know, but you know, in some of the other weird writers. Maybe you know, not, maybe not so obvious that that, that is. Yeah, well, I think their left, you know, tries to make a cosmology out of Lovecraft that's much that's much more in line with traditional religious conceptions. Um, and it's interesting because, in some ways, Lovecraft puts puts you know some pressure on the idea that uh, that humanism would be the dominant mode. Of of relationships. I mean, Lovecraft is more like the 19th century nat- naturalist who he does not write like at all. I mean, Beers writes like them because he's almost one of them, but Lovecraft does not. But he, his philosophy is much co- closer to that. I mean, you know, a lot of the the naturalist writers, even some of the ones that we more know from regionalist writing, like Bret Hart, um, their conceptions of like human beings. And the grand scheme of nature is is kind of sad. You just don't really stand a chance. Um, Zola is another writer that's like that um, from France, and um, that's really interesting because that comes out of like social realism. Right? But the naturalist writers take social realism to a very uncomfortable place, and I think weird fiction does that in a like a almost reductio ad absurdum way. When we're talking about the American weird fiction writers, but it's, in, it's it's very important to point out that even though the American weird fiction writers are are aping the British context, I mean, let's be honest, Lovecraft is aping Victoriana. Well, Lovecraft, I mean, love this is particularly early Lovecraft. I mean, well, I mean, no, but it's 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 a good point to raise. I mean, because love this is another example of where Lovecraft definitely reminds me of one of our core figures, at least uh, for our conception of modernism, Eliot. Like, Lovecraft and Eliot are definitely alike in one particular realm. They're alike in many realms. But in this realm, they're both Americans who wanted to be English. One was more successful. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's interesting that you have that. Whereas the con- the American context of Lovecraft, though, I think is underplayed. Because his relationship to the social realist and to the naturalist is clearly there. His his interest in science, his interest in removing human beings from the center of the of the picture, the narrative. Um, 
particularly in relationship to the naturalist writers. I mean, this, like Sarah R. and Julia, you know, are the early Harper's realists. Yeah. But, you know, social relations are all important. You know, that's why the socialists love them so much, right? I mean, like, they were trying, they were writing, like, you know, realist fiction for, for change. And you have stuff like Sinclair Lewis. And um, whereas the naturalists aren't, they don't seem to be, as interested in change and in fact they might doubt that it's possible now a lot of these remember all these categories were, were placing on the people who would not have thought of themselves that way um naturalism was a movement in france and it's kind of a movement in the united states but not really it's hard to break it down exactly um weird fiction is a movement now but at the time it was more of a advertising label or way to market your your fiction, it wasn't, you know, actually until, until Lovecraft's essay on it, it really wasn't a movement at all. Um, it was, I mean, you could be as crass about it as simply saying weird fiction was that which was, was published in weird magazine. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And people who influenced them. Right. Whereas, uh, in his essay, supernatural horror and literature is really where weird fiction is defined both retrospectively and, you know, a sort of thing to, to emulate. Before him, it's just like a discombobulation of horror writers, like gothic writers and some realists. Yeah, and there, it's interesting, though, because the, a lot of the, the, the supernatural fiction that Lovecraft mentions in that essay do have tendential relationships to naturalism. There's a lot of very regional horror that he mentions. And, you know, from from the Americas, now... Now, from from Britain, it's very, very different. It's it's much more in a particular vein that doesn't have as much to do with naturalism as we were talking about. Like, there's a very different field for, from, like, say, Lord Dungarsani or even Algernon Blackwood um, to some of the other writers he mentions. That's telling, but I think the American context is there. I will push. Back, let's. I will push back a little bit on Algernon Blackwood in the sense that I would, especially if you read uh, the Wendigo and the Willows. I think the naturalism in there does spring forth. I think those, in in a weird way, those two stories remind me. Uh, the Willows, not so much, but the Wendigo definitely feels not just because of its setting, feels like an American story. Oh yeah. I, I, okay, I'll agree with you there. The the Wendigo. <laughs> Like, the Wendigo, like, parts of it read like you could be reading a Bret Hart story about, you know, people going out to the witness and encountering something strange. Um, except in a Bret Hart story, you would just die of cold exposure. <laughs> but, um, you know, that that's that's the, the primary difference. Instead of encountering a weird, nebulous spirit of a cannibal, you would just freeze to death. But um, it's, definitely, it's definitely there, and I think... Like, weird fiction, if you want to periodize it in a particular way, it could be seen as the, like, natural combination of naturalism with romanticism, which are two things that seem like they don't really go together. But weird fiction proves that they do. You know, particularly in the case of Lovecraft, there's not a lot of social realism involved. I think S.C. Josie mentioned there's not a lot of social realism involved, but there is a lot of, like, psychological scientific and cosmological realism involved. So well, let's let's pre also press on this. Like wh why do you think that the the social element is missing? Uh, Cuz I I would argue, I mean is it a question of was it consciously not there or is it accidentally not there? You know, um in the case of Lovecraft I think it's consciously not there. Right. I mean, Lovecraft's political ideas change over time. Um, he starts off really, really conservative, and he sort of dies a moderate socialist, not a Marxist or anything, but but definitely a moderate socialist. He talks about how, you know, towards the end of his age, that, uh, like, before he died, that the New Dealers were right about most everything. You know, and also, like, his racism depleted a little bit, which is not to make apologetics for it. He stayed a racist his whole life. Let's not and a particularly virulent one in the early part, but the, it became less and less the crucial element of his stories and his ideas, which is interesting because it, it's almost the opposite pathway that you see in Elliot. Now, I don't think Elliot was ever an active racist. I'm not accusing mm -hmm. him of that at all. 
No, like I will, I won't, I won't say he wasn't, he didn't express anti-Semitic elements in his fiction, but I think if you stack those two gentlemen together, Eliot is far more an enlightened figure in that front. Although I don't think anti-Semitism really plays much of a role in Lovecraft. He doesn't seem to like black people. <laughs> well, he, he also doesn't like Slavs. He doesn't, he basically doesn't like non-Nordic individuals. Yeah, I, I forgot. He's actually got a problem with the Dutch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting. Like it is, but even when we think about his approach to socialism and, and let's also like press on this more because I think it, it, there's a lot of things in it that can be worth unpacking his even his late life socialism reminds me of a sort of aristocratic socialism something you'd kind of see in um, sort of de- veering away from literature but you sort of saw it in uh, uh, Visconti you know the great Italian film uh, director uh, uh, um, right, exactly. And it's like a socialism which they respect and flock towards socialism because that they consider socialism the best critique of the sort of bourgeois businessmen figures who are fucking up their idea of, you know, the an aristocratic, you know, sort of, you know, society of gentlemen. Yeah, plus, like, you know, take care of the poor so that they don't, like, get too crazy. And <laughs> exactly. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a paternalism towards the poor. Yeah, I mean, yes. And I would say Lovecraft's Socialist ideas were more in the line of that, which is not to say that all weird fiction writers are that reactionary. I don't think most of the current ones are. I mean, a lot of them are standard liberals, and some of them may be to the left of that. They're not – like, it's not – you don't have – I don't think in any of the weird fiction writers, you don't have, like, the history of a bizarre relationship with Marxism, for example, that you do in the modernist writers yeah. or in the realist writers. I mean, so many of the realist writers – were were socialist or communists? It, not as much in France, weirdly, but but definitely in the United States. Um, at the very least, they were liberals. The nationalists are harder to place. They, they tended to be left wing ish, but they also tended to have, be pretty misanthropic, and that makes you know dreams about socialism a little bit harder. Um, I think, though, like what I would say about weird fiction writers, not universally, but I think fairly commonly. And, and again, this is one, one other connection I would have with certain modernists is that they are reactionary, not reactionary in the sort of political like arch white wing sense necessarily, but reactionary in the sense of like whatever was happening in their society could be political, social what, whatever was happening, there was some sort of upheaval for them that they were responding to. And right. I, I mean, the standard liberal now is a reactionary, and I'm not, and I don't mean that in, as a condemnation of of liberalism. I mean that is like most of what you read and say the liberal blogosphere from liberal authors is like reacting to such and such a crisis or you know whatever. I think I think most writers are reactionary. Right. Um, even when they can try to fool themselves that they're not, it's because writers are reacting to things. That's how they have their social context. Utopian writing sometimes, you know, usually ends up being satirical, even when it doesn't start off that way. One of the, the, the most interesting things about, for example, Brave New World is originally that novel was not really supposed to be a dystopia. It just became one as he wrote. Well, what's it? Yeah, that's the interesting thing about Brave, Brave New World's dystopia is the dystopia of the utopia. <laughs> to be to be right. to be weird about it. Yeah, uh, but but that, I mean that's that is an interesting you know thing. I mean, arguably, you know, in the point of sort of quote unquote scientific progression. You know, arguably, you know, various tools are getting developed. Uh, scientism, arguably, is is growing up in the world. Um, the uh, the various sort of mechanisms are being designed, which would arguably conceive to have made the world either more manageable or easier to live in or more understandable. Interestingly enough, creates more and more anxiety. <laughs> well, it's also interesting in that. Lovecraft's primary point is the more you understand about the world, the less you understand it. Right. Um, the, the more facts and you just realize that humans are not important and that there are things that you really can't understand. Um, I mean, it's interesting to me, too, because, for example, if you look at, like, patterns of Lovecraft's popularity, he was never unpopular. But at the time of, say, the 50s, 
when, when, for example, science fiction, and when we do our science fiction and modernism, we'll really talk about this more, but science fiction was super optimistic about the future, with the exception of the, of the, uh, the nuclear war allegory apocalypses, right? But everything else was super optimistic as a general rule. Low class is not as popular then. Um, but it's interesting because he's just as scientifically minded and in some ways maybe more. Right. I mean, compared to a lot of his fellow writers, like he actually went out of his way to study it. Admittedly, he didn't do as well as he probably ultimately thought he was going to do, but he at least studied it. Well, he's also in a time where, like, what was passing for legitimate science would strike us as ludicrous. But the scientific methods, as we understand them, particularly in the United States, weren't, weren't as developed. I mean, we didn't have a royal society, so it took a while. I think that's that to me is a very interesting and fascinating problem. Um, you know, I, Joshi really writes about this a lot, um, and you see a little bit in uh, Robert Price's work on Minecraft too. That's where you are. So, but we haven't really talked about anything we published. We're just talking about Lovecraft, so we should probably move on. Right. So I think one of the things I was interesting in moving on to. Well, I mean, because we, especially since we talked a lot about the quote unquote canonical weird fiction writers. So let's say the early 20th century. Let's push forward to if, you know, for lack of a better term, the contemporary context. So, you know, in our issue, you discuss three, at least three books of note, um, and sort of what their, you know, either in their modes of expression or the content of their stories. How are they sort of thinking about somewhat similar questions now? Where are they doing things different? And how, again, do we see a quote-unquote new modernism coming out of here? Well, one thing I've noticed about the, the term back to, to weird fiction is that at least right now, it's, it's one of the genres that's most comfortable with uh, literary experimentation. Although that's, I, I should be careful of saying that because it's also true of science fiction now. I mean, all of the genres seem more comfortable with with literary, with like literary experiment, but it's it's definitely something to consider because if you look at um, writers like Laird Barron or like uh, John Langan, there's much more obviously the influence of working outside um, just genre fiction. The writing standards have gone up, even if the editing standards of the publishers haven't. But the writing standards have gone up. The three books I review, um, they're, none of them are marketed as weird fiction per se. Um, John Langwood's The Wild Carnivorous Guy, Ogawa's uh, Revenge, Eleven Dark Tales, and Nathan Bullingen's um, North American Lake Monsters. Um, all of them have weird elements in them. Um, in Langan's work, it's more directly Weird. I mean, there's, there's, all, and there's also more direct references to genre fiction. In Bolligren, the monsters, be they weird monsters, are just traditional horror monsters, or sort of just emphasis for normal, for normal fiction. Um, they're there as tension heighteners. And in Ogawa's work, the weird is more of a pervasive feeling of fairy tale that's just incredibly bleak and dark. Um, they're all sort of interested in, 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 in the ways humans get caught up in things much larger than themselves, in some ways very anti-human, and still how much immersed in their own lives they are. And unlike Lovecraft, at least Bollingren's extremely concerned with social relations, poverty in the South, the the very strained relationships between men and women, the way money affects that. That's all a backdrop to the piece. And um and Ogwa Ogwawa's concerns are also similarly rooted in tragic loss of children, the inability to state yourself, the inability to to speak plainly, um, the inability to really understand, and there's all sorts of like identity overlaps and stuff in it. All of the works, except for Bolinguin, have metafictive elements, which is interesting, which is something you consider you would not normally have considered with modernism. Yeah, so, um, let's 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 think about that in a little deeper, because I think what, what's interesting and a way of sort of thinking about these uh, 
these newer weird writers as opposed to the old weird writers is the whole question uh, of how they sort of are responding to literature in the aftermath of postmodernism. So, for example, when we think of these weird fiction writers, we had mentioned that they're sort of mixing genre, you know, so, um, you know, either the weird fiction as sort of like pulp fiction or mm. the fairy tale or what have you. They're having a conception of literature where I'm using sort of genre elements as a vehicle to explore something greater. So arguably they wouldn't, they didn't necessarily have to do that. That's the way they're going as opposed to some of the original weird fiction writers who wouldn't have even considered themselves that way. They may have been pulp writers, but they didn't think they were playing in the pulp uh, milieu as a means of reaching something higher. They just were relegated to the pulp. So I think that's mm -hmm. an interesting sort of self-referential or self-reflective view on their writing, which may be different in a significant way to how the core or canonical weird writers were thinking about these things. Yeah, I think so. You know, and... You just have to put people in the historical context of their time, whereas, you know, people are reacting to late Victorian literature when weird, weird fiction really shows up and to dark romanticism and all that. My contemporary writers might be pulling from that. I mean, I can promise you they are, but they have to respond to postmodernism. Um, they also have to respond to a lot of changing market conditions. Uh, pulp writing is not as lucrative as it used to be. It's actually a lot more like when Lovecraft wrote. There's a, you know, there's sort of a weird period in time, basically from like 1950 to 1990, where pulp writing could really make a lot of money. But now with the internet, things are actually going back to a historical norm. <laughs> where pulp writers can make money, but not much. And um, and so to really stand out, you really need to be a good literary writer, too. And I think there's there's a lot of that right now. I also think that there's an exhaustion with even experimental literary writing. I mean, um, it, it, it it's interesting that even someone who writes straight ahead horror like Stephen Graham Jones um, uh, started his writing career as a like experimental fiction writer. And so you see a lot of that right now. And I think some of that is just basically part of, partly because of the market. Yes, yeah, so I think that maybe going into a little bit of one of my questions, which is sort of why even play with being in this genre at all? So conceivably, um, they could, and, and obviously it's going to depend on each writer, they could conceivably just say, do it quote unquote straight. Like, uh, all of the books you mentioned, maybe with the exception of Ogata, uh, I think are, can the stories can in some sense be told without the so-called pulp elements or the weird elements in them. Right. You change it a little bit in there, but so like why? And Ogata is, actually is was not originally written to be a weird a, a weird book. Ogata's book was written in Japan, you know, eleven years ago. And has only just been translated recently and marketed as weird fiction. Um, and it is. I'm not going to say it's not. It meets most of the criteria. But it's not um, exactly the same thing as uh, as the other two books. I actually don't think Langdon, Langdon's book would work as straight fiction. Langdon can write straight fiction. He's he's, you know, a solid writer. He's a good he's a good literary um, professor, but he, he he actually seems very much interested in the limitation of genre itself. Um, like, each of his stories seem to be written from the perspective of picking one genre limitation and one formal experimental limitation and working out from there. So that's pretty important. You know, as for the rest of it, as for the rest of it, no, I mean, Bowling and Grunt stories particularly could be straight stories. You know, they read a lot like Raymond Chandler stories. If you took the supernatural elements out, you would you would still have those kind of sort of straight stories. They actually wouldn't be as good, though, because it is the the intrusion of something from the outside that that makes the the melodrama understandable. That would be one reason is is that the tension, the the additional restriction gives you an ability to play with things that's harder to play with otherwise. It puts people in extreme situations. It's a good prop. The other thing is, I think, also has to do with readership. And even though none of this makes money, I think a lot of people feel like liter straight literary fiction 
has fallen into a rut. I mean, I even heard at AWP 10 years ago someone talking about literary fiction essentially just being a realist genre of literature. And this sort of brings us back to something we discussed earlier, or at least something I brought up earlier in various other formats, which is this notion of, if you really think about it, literary fiction in and of itself is becoming a sort of genre. By that I mean it has, a, a, as a genre, certain tropes that it needs to finish, complete, um, manifest, what have you. And as a result of that, rather than trying to do something above and beyond that, it just simply is delivering on the genre. And thus is subject to as much critique as some of the pure, you know, mediocre genre fiction that you can encounter day in and day out. And I think this is actually a particularly interesting segue to uh, one of the reviews we had published in the journal, which was uh, S.D. Joshi's review of Laird Barron's latest short story collection. And I think an interesting comment which Joshi made, which I think was probably, and quite rightly, um, get garnered the attention of our readers, was the critique of certain element of Laird's writing as you know, famously quote-unquote highfalutin. And again, this brings me back to the main uh, issue at hand, which we just discussed a few seconds ago, which is the idea of literature going above and beyond genre, or more specifically, genre literature going above and beyond the limits of genre. And uh, let's t let's talk about that. And I think uh, we can even think about the specific story. I know uh, Joshi in particular seemed to have trouble with Vacitation, which I believe is a story um, in, a, in a collection which asks writers to posit uh, what if the Lovecraftian gods had managed to take over the earth. And, you know, it seems that, uh, you know, Baron's story seems to produce certain complications uh, for Joshi at the very least, maybe more people. You know, the, 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 central, the, the, the central character in the story, for example, um, actually is literally the only person on earth. Um, there are other things on earth, but the only human being. And that presents a lot of, of challenges. And, you know, it, it, the thing is with, uh, with Leia Baron is there's a lot of poetry in his writing. He also works as a, has worked as a poet and he, there's a lot of influence, influences that read to me, um, more along the line of, say, someone like David Markson where perspective is really important. And calling that highfalutin just seems like kind of a, frankly, lazy criticism. And I generally think S. Josie is an excellent critic, and he's he's a hands-down great scholar. But when I read that line in the original review, I was like, really? You're going to go there? I mean, it's, you know, it's like I don't like stuff that reads like complicated modernist literature. I don't like complication for its own sake. Right, so there's... That's I don't think the complication isn't even for its own sake. No, so, I mean, there are conceivably two ways of uh, reading that uh, statement and wanting to respond to it. Uh, one way, I think, is more what he meant than the other. So if he if he just simply means, you know, a sort of arch-language, purplish prose, well, that sort of then begs the question of what do you make of Lovecraft? I mean, Lovecraft is not known for just you know, simplicity of language or even the simplicity of what he's doing on a literary style. Or, uh, you know, if we're, to, to your point, if, if, he, if we are concerned with literary archness, I read that, maybe I'm aggressively reading that as an anxiety over literature, genre literature, which is seeking to look past its own genre. And that I would actively and aggressively say, no, I, I, that is not my mindset. I, I think we've, I mean, we've discussed it in many of our interviews and podcasts. I mean, the idea of somehow being bound by genre and the genre rules and the genre dictates seems a little bit too claustrophobic inducing for me as a reader and most definitely someone as a writer who is interested in doing a little bit more. And I don't hold that against anyone for doing that. In fact, I think they're trying 
something much more interesting than per se re reproducing uh let's say Lovecraft stories, which even Joshi says he wouldn't want to see anybody do. Right. Um I think you know there's a lot to that. Um it's hard to to say, you know, that every story works exactly, but it's just I don't think that highfalutin is a particularly strong criticism. You know, it's basically accusing someone of pretentiousness without actually going there. The the, the unfortunate uh you know predicament we're in is that uh the play comes uh at the end of the review without um a, a, a detailed discussion of what it was. So unfortunately, you know, we don't really have too much of what Joshi was referencing in particular to go off of. Uh, we have the discussion earlier of like a particular uh, story in the book he was sort of frustrated with, but I yeah. don't think it's related. And some also, like, there's some crypto mentioned. There, there's some things if you read the authors that he praises and some authors that he sort of complicates, you see some tendencies. For example, he seems to take a, a, a sort of swipe at Thomas Ligotti a little bit um, in, the, in the review. Or at least a lot of people perceived that he did. I don't think he actually ever uh, directly does so. But that was what a lot of people read him saying uh, this week. And then he also praises Ramsey Campbell and K uh, Caitlin Kiernan, who are both excellent writers on a word-by-word -word level, don't get me wrong, but they're very um, hard-boiled and direct. So... You know, it's also the list of names he mentions as a standard of comparison to give you an indication of what it means. And in the Lovecraft world, you know, you could almost divide the camps into two, like almost divide the camps amongst the modern American New Year writers, whether or not your, fam your famous, uh, favorite famous one is Thomas Ligotti or Caitlin Kiernan. So there's more than just the immediate... Um, aesthetic judgment at hand. It's, there's also a vague polemic against the camp. But it's vague. It's not the point of the review. The review is overwhelmingly positive and very well thought out. And I think the fact that he threw that off at the end um, as sort of a caveat to just you know let people know that there are things to be critical about the book about, which I think is a fine thing to do because it's about setting the tone of a positive review where you have caveats. If you dwell on the caveats, it seems that the positive review actually reads negatively. So I get that. But it, it just seems – we could argue all day about what he even means by it. You know? Right, and I think the – so there's a couple of reasons why I, I was interested in discussing it. Um, one, on a, on a sort of like lower level, I, I did notice in discussion of the review that the attention seemed to really uh, direct itself towards that end, towards that caveat section. So I think it's a uh, – uh, it would be important to at least raise the issue on our level as editors. But I think on a higher level, uh, again, it relates to the questions of certain uh, aesthetics that, that you and I – uh, share have talked about regularly and why I think, you know, this is a good example of sort of manifesting why we think the way we do and why it's not necessarily number one, identical to everyone else or two, per se identical, even with all of the people, uh, that we publish. Um, we don't no. believe in, you know, a uniformity of all thought. Well, I just, I, I, I just think criticizing something like being highfalutin is not a particularly useful criticism at the end of the day. Because it's, like I said earlier, it's actually, it, it seems specific, but it's actually quite vague. Um, but dwelling on that can get us lost in a lot of things. And so I think it's to be avoided. But obviously, yes, it was the most highly debated part of the review. Conversely, I distrust over, you know overly positive reviews myself. So, you know, having a criticism in there, even if I disagree with it, is an important thing. Right. Uh, well, I mean, well, I have a little bit uh, different attitude uh, toward that. I mean, I agree definitely in general with that idea. But I know from my own review of of Doug's book, I did not choose to go too too deeply into certain criticisms, largely because I didn't have. Uh, I, the criticisms I did have, I didn't think were uh, were detailed enough to really go into. And ultimately, 
the main criticism I have wasn't so much a criticism as ultimately do I or do I not agree with Doug's vision of the possibility for a certain type of imagination. And I think I do go into that, how I ultimately don't have an answer. Yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to, to say exactly. I, I can say that I did not particularly like the, that particular criticism. I can also say that I don't think, you know, that I don't think that, I don't think that was the main point of Joshi's, Review and I think maybe people are are looming too much on it. Perhaps for the very reason that you said, why you didn't include some of your criticisms of maybe a say um, Douglas Lane's book because um, you didn't have time to fully develop them and they may not be aesthetic as such. Uh, but this one is definitely aesthetic as such. It may be just purely aesthetic and thus a matter of taste. Right. I mean, I, I think that's fair. I mean. Uh... And I think everybody who thinks a lot, we're thinking a lot about the negative portion of the review, uh, you know, should probably go back and read the top 80 percent of the review, which is very strongly uh, in favor of the book. And, you know, always, always, we always have to keep these things into perspective. Um, but I agree, you know, it's I the the point you're talking about is a, it seems more of a preference than per, uh, a pure sort of structured criticism, if you will. Which, which is, which to me, like, that's fine. That just, that just doesn't, I don't know that that's illuminating or illuminating to anything but Joseph's opinion. Um, which again is fine. You know, I, I think we all have questionable judgment, judgments. When my review of Nathan Bolagran and John Langan and, uh, Ogawa, um, I said some pretty harsh things about Ogawa. Um, although I, I don't know if it's the stories of the translator. And it's a book I quite like, but, it had some effects in reading aesthetically that I thought just didn't go anywhere. Um, that the voices became really similar. A lot of the description was flattened out. And even though it sort of helped the overall message of the book, which is, had a very procedural theme, it didn't necessarily make it easy to even distinguish who was speaking all the time. So. Right. And admittedly, um, uh, it's been a while since I've done my my uh, Japanese, but I, it, it could conceivably be the structure of the language and how they decided to translate it. I mean, there is certain pr pronunciations which differentiate depending on who you're talking to. But if you don't have a really sharp translator, you're going to lose that. Yeah, well, yeah, I know that from Korean. And, yeah. uh, the The particles at the end of the sentence, um, particularly at the last verb, really determine... Um, like formality and social context and gender and all of that, and uh, that doesn't that that is not translatable into English. Um, so you know, dealing with non-Indo-European languages, and I, I'm well aware of that. Although there are some comments in the book itself that like the author makes some offhand comments to some of the characters about stories in the book. That they indicate that she actually is aware of the criticism that's going to be leveled at her. So it must also be partly something in the uh, in in the Japanese itself, because she talks at one point about the stories being interesting, but the characters not being well developed and the description being kind of bland in the book about a person reading a book that is supposed to be the book in the book. So right, so postmodern uh, uh, effects are happening there. In fact, actually, it would be a good uh, idea if anybody listening uh, is aware of the Jap the Japanese uh, response to the novel and can maybe pull up and you know and tell us what the, what that response was in the in the native language. Yeah, I, you know, I would actually like to know too because I mean, the other thing about that book in particular is that it took uh, it took nine years to get it to get it translated. Um, so like it came out in English, you know, last year, but it's actually quite an old book in Japan and it's almost a decade old. Well, that, now that's interesting, I guess. Uh, is that, a uh, my assumption is that it did not take nine years to figure out how to translate it. It probably took oh, nine no. years to get attention. It took nine years to get attention. And I think it got attention for other things. Like I think, her work is uh, more known for some two literary novels that she wrote, not her, not her weird, you know, interconnected short stories. And um, I also think 
it was hard to market this book because it was in between a lot of um, genre considerations. So it's it's marketed as a literary book, but like by the publisher, so it didn't go to a publisher like Tor. Um, but it's marketed as a. Uh, it's also like very obviously being marketed as like a suspense thriller book. The way they did the cover and stuff, which it's not. Well, I guess that's that's this is the interesting uh, conundrum we're in. Again, related to the aesthetics that you and I like, which is the difficult to place story or novel. Uh, it, in some way, you, we're very strongly beholden to the capability of people to market it, or even, if I get, get even bleak, you know, people to even receive it. Like, if uh, people, you know, take a book, they say, oh, you know, I, I thought it was this, but it, it turned out to be something I don't know. I don't know how to respond to that. Uh, I've actually seen some responses to Doug's Lane, Doug Lane's book where they go in seeing it as a fantasy and then are surprised to which its fantasy is unlike a fantasy they were anticipating as i've said in my review it's it's a it, there's nothing physically challenging in the fantasy of Doug's book it's a, it's an alternative what might have been fantasy but there i mean don't get me wrong there are a couple moments where there are it is true fantasy but they they fall into the background fairly quickly uh but it, it's interesting like how do people even well if people don't even know how to respond to it as consumers how are we going to you know market it yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, Doug's book is not selling as well as we would like. It's the first book from a from tour, and he's a critically well received author. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's hard to say on on these things. Um, I would say that you know the analogy to magical realism holds. I also think. That it, you know, Doug's book is in a way an alternate history, but they didn't want to market it like that. I'm not sure why they didn't want to market it like that, actually. But because mm-hmm. it is an alternate history with magical realist elements and also very literary concerns. And it seems like if you're someone like a Margaret Atwood, you can get away with that pretty easily. Um, but if you're not, it's much harder. Right. I mean, it, it's, I guess it's the ultimate question. I mean, it, it, it seems like we're leaning more towards, you know, Tor books. It's like, so why does Tor books have an anxiety over this book? Um, there are, you know, potential stories about why this might be the case. Uh, who knows? Yeah, but why? But then why would you accept it to publish it? Because if you've read any of, of Douglas Lane's fiction, this is actually some of the more normal stuff. I mean, like, right. his his stuff veers almost into not, um, like, maybe what would be considered magical realism, but probably and more profoundly considered, you know, bizarro fiction. Um, and those things have cult followings in their own presses, but they don't have, one thing they do not have is a lot of representation in genre presses like Tor. And so it's hard, it's very hard to market any of that. Um our mission increasingly is to market that stuff and to put it in in, in context. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, my, my working theory, and again related to why we have an interest in publishing this, is that there's the notion outside of genre fiction that if you're in the genre fiction, you can't be taken seriously. Or if, from the people who publish genre, if you are in the genre fiction and you try to do something seriously, there's a concern over that as if like you're ignoring the genre or you're talking down to your audience, neither of which I think are true. Um, but also, I don't think I, I will say in my experience, I have not seen that very much in certain genres now. For example, I would actually say science fiction does not have that concern anymore. It did. But you, if you see who's writing science fiction right now, um, you don't see a lot of people haranguing over the the genre restrictions of hard of hard sci-fi or soft sci-fi anymore, and there's a lot of literary writers writing it. But and that's also definitely true for weird fiction. People can get away with a whole lot. Um, but um, with genres that are harder to to deal with in that way, it would be like alternative history or our our fantasy, where the, it seems like the parameters and scope and focus of the genre are much more limited. 
you know. So um, I think a lot of the hostility comes from the literary world itself, which has a hostility to genre fiction and an inferiority complex to it, because traditionally genre fiction has been easier to make a living at, <laughs> although that's not necessarily true anymore. Um, but, you know. Right. I mean, it, in, in we, I think we, we you and I have thought about this before. You know, there was a certain period of time when people made that transition a little bit easier. Uh, so we talked about Margaret Atwood, but also Kurt Vonnegut, very obvious example. Um, I was about uh, Philip. I wouldn't say Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick is this weird anomaly that I don't even think can be described in much of anything. Um, but there is a certain degree of like mainstream element uh, that he was able to achieve at, at one point in time. Um, I don't know. It, it is an interesting point. It's like, is, the, it, is this going to be a cyclical sort of response where like it's easier to sell something odd that can sort of float in space? And then is that going to go away? Who knows? Uh, but at the very least, we can act as a force, at least with some noise, maybe not a loud noise, but some noise and able to promote this and publish it to the best of our abilities. Yeah, you know, that, that's that's what we, we wish to do. I mean, it's interesting because we're also trying to do, you know, our missions are various and people might think that, you know, we, we have a hard genre focus. And if you look at our next lineup of issues, that's just frankly not true. I mean, we have one more genre issue in six months. Um, the other concerns are about world literature, Eastern European literature and translation, Russian literature and translation. Um, what is the avant-garde now? You know, these are not things that, that are typically questions. That, right. That, uh, yeah. If our exercise was simply resurrecting uh, genre or uh, raising genre, um, we would just have every issue be about that. Uh, it, it not, we, admittedly, we are doing it a little bit, but we're always putting it in context of other questions. I think at the end of the day, what that really means is that we're taking it seriously. Right. Know, taking them seriously to the point where we can have the weird fiction issue next to the avant-garde issue, next to the Eastern European issues, and not feel like, oh, you know, they're all over the board. I mean, there's a certain degree, yes, art, we're wide-reaching, but there's a relationship between all of these. And right, like, and, you know, which is why in these theme issues we go back and talk to people and all the various things prior to. Um, and, and particularly once we start getting into, like, the Eastern European literature, I think you'll find that – you know, and a lot of the contemporary Russian literature that I read, such as uh, Victor Pele, uh, Pelevin and um, uh, Vladimir uh, Sorunkin, um, uh, Victor Pele, Pelevin, uh, all these authors, you know, write about things that would be definitely into the realm of almost weird fiction. Um, they're the biggest literary authors in Russia right now. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to talk about that. Um, furthermore, I mean, you know, we have interest in poetry. There's not a lot of weird poetry. Uh, Joe Pulver wrote some poetry that would arguably be weird fiction. You know, we have a very broad mandate in what we're trying to do. Uh, another thing that we might want to mention, though, is to expand on that broad mandate, we're going to need more people to come on board as reviewers and interviewers. And so we are going to be welcoming people to to send in samples of the work if they would like to do this for us. It's volunteer work. It's not uh, It's not paid. We don't pay ourselves either, um, at least not yet. And when we start paying ourselves, we'll pay you too. But um, but it, it would be a good way to get your thoughts out there. And we need this because we wish to actually review all the books. And it's not so much writing the reviews, although that takes time. It's reading the books and writing the reviews and holding down regular jobs. So... <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, to give the book a level of criticism that it's due. I mean, I know professional reviewers can do it in like a couple days, what have you. But I mean, for the level that we're thinking, the professional reviewers don't do anything else either. Yes, exactly. Well, I, they they don't have jobs outside of their professional reviewing and and a couple of other essays that they write. Uh, so yeah, it, it is difficult to do it. But also, you know, what what more importantly than the time factor? I mean, don't get me wrong; it is important. Is you know, we you, the two of us can only read so much at the end of the day. Is the is the issue, and we have certain tracks that we try to go down. But I think what we're both interested in is being. 
pleasantly surprised. And it doesn't like pleasantly surprised along the lines of, oh, I wasn't thinking this was good. Now it is good. Maybe that is true. But just things that we weren't even thinking about. And ultimately, you know, I think that's best served by having people outside of us thinking about these questions. And again, to his uh, earlier point about this being something of a community feel to it, I mean, that's essential to the matter. So I would echo uh, Derek's point in, in simply saying that, yes, I mean, to the extent to which you've read a book that you think is very important, um, or if you think it's related to us or whatever, you know, is crossing your mind, you know, feel free to tell us and, you know, send the samples over. I mean, our submissions are pretty wide ranging to begin with. So uh, if you, you know, if you're writing a review of a book, that's more than welcome. It doesn't have to necessarily just come from the two of us. Yeah. I mean, we're not, we're not, you know, although if it does come from the two of us, maybe we can get you review copies of payment, but um, there'll be e-review copies because I live in Mexico and I'm not mailing anything to you, but you'll get them. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, that's, that's one of the things we would like to see. I mean, if if you have an interest in any of the themes that we're going to talk about in the next six months, we would love to see your work. Um, particularly because this is, these are sometimes things that's harder to get stuff out there about. Uh, and that note, we've mentioned that our long-term goals that probably at the end of the year were to put out an anthology. Another long-term goal, our long-term goal that's much more immediate is we've had more than one reader request that we do an ebook for a small fee, like two dollars or so, to uh, make it easier for people who don't mind reading on devices but hate reading on a web browser. And so, starting with issue five, we're going to try to convert all our old issues into an ebook every four or five issues or so. Um, and it'll be variable for cheap. The money raised will be used to pay for the for a uh, server expansion and um, some other things and once those are paid for maybe we can give token payments to our to our you know submitters maybe I'm not making promises no there are no guarantees of future performance you know past performance is no guarantee of future performance uh, to, to quote that old uh, adage from any sort of investment you make uh, right, but we do believe that at least a token and pr a payment of appreciation should be made, but we can't do that until we have more resources, and the only way we can get more resources is to, for you guys to want products uh, that we provide. Now, we're not going to ever charge for the magazine, which is sort of a bad business model, um, but for things like the ebooks and the anthologies and anything that's in print or even ebook form, we need compensation because I'm going to have to spend a couple of my hours, you know, writing that <laughs> um, and designing that ebook so that it doesn't look like Bud um, and getting that to you. Um, so we, we, we hope that you're interested in it. We'll fill you in more um, about who, which, you know, who we're going to work with and how we're going to get those out. Um, but we will be getting them out, and on the profits, we'll go back into the magazine and increasing the server and hopefully paying authors one day. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, point of discussion above and beyond the uh, quote-unquote ebook print uh, issues that we're doing, we are you know, expanding in a couple of other levels. First, uh, we had so we had mentioned our uh, – relationship with Doug Lane. So we are, you've probably even heard us on Diet Soap with Doug Lane. If you haven't, I suggest you do. Uh, so we are actually expanding that relationship as well. So Doug will be contributing a uh, periodic column for us. Uh, Derek can talk about a little bit what that's going to entail, but also on a perhaps bi-monthly uh, sh schedule once we figure it out um, or when our schedule is allow for it, you know, there will be a movie review uh, podcast co-produced with Diet Soap and former people, again, sort of reflecting yeah. some of the questions we have here. Um, the first episode, as we're planning, is Tarkovsky. How do you say his name? Tarkovsky? Tarkovsky is, is correct, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Russian names, man. <laughs> for, for, as a side note to our listeners, we are, we are both products of Eastern Europe. I can't pronounce things in my own native language, I don't think. So uh, pronouncing things in my ancestral languages is even harder. 
Um, but anyway. Uh, well, in my case, it's you, you grow up as a young child, and even to th- these days with people who were born and raised in Russia or Poland, you, and they primarily speak Polish or Russian, you just get used to it. But th- that is a really particular moment in time that is difficult to reproduce and, you know, fades away from my memory, unfortunately, the older I get and the further removed I get from the source. But hopefully that can be avoided on some level. Yeah, he, Polish is kind of like French, except instead of vowels that aren't pronounced, it's consonants that aren't pronounced. But hey! Um, it's more like consonants that turn into vowels. Yeah, what's with that? Anyway, um... You you have transgender consto vowels, but anyway, uh, that may or may not stay in. That's a joke that only I find funny. Um, I just I I my patrician facade prevents me from laughing out loud, but I assure you, I am enjoying it. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's funny too. The patrician facade shows up um, even. Uh, even Douglas Lane, he has you in a suit and me in like a t-shirt saying something about literature on that. <laughs> and, I, and he was the man that looks like I'm Norman Mailer ready to stab you. And yes, <laughs> and I'm just like staring gleefully like like the wild-eyed academic that I am. Um, <laughs> the context of that's even funnier as a background is that pictures from me standing in the sun in the deserts outside of Mexico, and it's superimposed them to a mall. <laughs> yeah, um, mine is, I don't even know where I took that. Uh, that is actually a reference to, you know, the sweet smell of success. It's to the uh, J.J. Geddes. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, I've mixed up Chinatown now. Uh, it, it's uh, J.J. Hunsucker, uh, Burt Lancaster's character in The Sweet Smell of Success. He holds a pen somewhat like that. So uh, interpret that as you will. It's hard to, to say which one of us is more pretentious, but <laughs> but uh, but but my pretension is much more plebeian than yours. <laughs> I make no excuses. <laughs> yeah, true, <laughs> but um, I don't know what that says about us. But anyway, uh, I think I think we can end here. Um, I'd like to remember remind everybody. If you want to be a regular reviewer for us, just send us a sample of your work. Um, and maybe we'll publish that sample. Um, we are looking for reviewers who are particularly interested in anything that's between genres, are innovative, and that, who have some working knowledge of modernism, because you kind of need it to work on a literary magazine about neo-modernism. But you don't need a lot. I mean, you know, you don't even have to have been an English major in college or even a minor. Just, you know. Have read T.S. Eliot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, probably have read Hemingway and Faulkner and um, usually maybe have seen a couple plays. That would be pretty good. <laughs> Basically, if you've read anything between like 1890 and 1960 and kind know of- the context at all, then yes, yeah, you can work with us. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't even have to be in English. <laughs> We uh, and we are going to go ahead and announce. Uh, there's a lot of interviews coming up in our next in our next uh, issue. Um, the interviews on the Latin, the Spanish novel, the Spanish language novel after Bolaño. Uh, interviews on the current state of Italian literature. Um, interviews on new authors you probably know that from Indian literature that write in English. Um, and an interview with John Langan. Um, on uh, the relationship between genre fiction and and world literature and modernism, which could have also gone in this last issue, but you know we keep things mixed up like that. Um, we uh, will have tons of poetry and hopefully some short stories, and um, we hope you continue interest in the project because if you're not interested, we're not doing it anymore. Well, uh, so, so on a more positive leaving note, uh, so I just want to thank everybody for reading the last issue. We had a significant boost in our readership, and obviously, to the you know, by significant, let's be specific, a thousand people looked at it in a day. <laughs>
you know, which for a literary magazine is pretty good. Um, so you don't have to worry about us quitting just yet. <laughs> well, it, more, more importantly, I think you know we were both very pleased to to see that, and obviously that is a product of you being interested in our work. So we absolutely thank you for that, and we are going to continue to do something uh, interesting as time goes on. Not obviously for our own interests, but you know to the degree to which it looks like a lot more people are finding interest in what we're doing, that will only encourage us to do more. So thank you very much for that. And on that note, I think it's probably time for us to shuffle off this uh, digital coil. So again, thank you for listening. We will see you in a month.